Couldn't answer questions about all the lies she told the FBI and federal prosecutors and investigators because she had a traumatic brain injury and disorder. But I thought that was a conspiracy theory. Here's the headline from Infowars.com. It was also in Associated Press, you name it, Reuters. Hillary couldn't answer FBI questions due to brain injury, Doc show. Clinton cited concussion for being unable to recall details regarding private email server. So she wants to be president, but she can't remember any details because she's so brain damaged. And it's a conspiracy theory to say that she is brain damaged. Even though the Secret Service has told this individual that she is seriously brain damaged and many times has trouble even walking. And you see her being reclusively held back from the public, being spirited, uh, being circuited. Uh, being uh, posited uh, into areas that uh, are very, very hard to see. Add this to a month ago, I myself and Donald Trump and others came out and said, we're really worried about election fraud in this campaign. We've got a long history of it. You try to steal the nomination from Trump. You did steal it from Bernie Sanders. We're going to be investigating. And Obama came out and said, this is preposterous. Why, the federal government doesn't investigate. Or the federal government doesn't uh, get involved in elections. It's all run by locals. Now they've come out and announced that Homeland Security is taking over and running the elections along with EU bureaucrats. So this is now all really unraveling uh, for the social for the social engineers. And they've got big problems with their deceptive narratives. But I want to ask you, the viewers today, on this Sunday, the fourth day of September 2016, are they crazy enough to try to put... A corpse, not just a physical person in bad shape, but a political corpse of an old, twisted dynasty. Thanks to the Republicans and Libertarians doing the right thing, real Libertarians, not Gary Johnson, the shell, we saw the Bush dynasty finally destroyed to a great extent, put away, discredited. But now, I guess they're back with another reincarnation of the Clintons. And the Clintons basically had two terms. The Obama, who they helped put in office, had two terms. This will be their fifth and sixth term if Hillary is able to get into the White House. It'll open it up for her sixth term. She'll be in for her fifth term as co-president. How far will this go? What will we put up with? Or have they gone too far? Putting a puppet like this in, even though the public is rejecting it, and even though that puppet itself is clearly flailing around having serious health problems. Now, that said, today is going to be a very special broadcast because I've got a lot of special reports we've never aired yet or special reports that are so important I want to air them again. And some of those uh, are the elite trying to become, quote, real-life vampires. I'm not saying Peter Thiel wants to be a vampire. I'm saying that all the major billionaires that we look at are obsessed with live ascension technologies and so much of that orbits around the blood of the young. So yes, this is really wild, really kooky, really crazy, but it's historic that ruling class elites are obsessed with the blood of the innocents over and over again. Then we'll ask the question, are the elite hijacking the second Earth discovery that we've seen almost no coverage of, but it's truly amazing information? Then we'll look back over a week ago to the truth about Hillary's alt-right speech. We'll look back at Matt Drudge warning of internet ghettos. Inquisition 2.0, the internet has begun its downward plunge with the New World Order taking it hostage. We also have breaking info. George Soros is taking over the internet. We have his own hacks, emails, and documents. It's all coming up. Also, we have Paul Watson's report that we aired on Friday dealing with the fact that we have Hillary shooting off her mouth about war with Russia, and that ties into my report, the threat of nuclear war is not fear porn. And that's just the first hour. I'm Alex Jones. Stay with us. Is the sun in the future of humanity rising, or is it setting? Has the age of the vampire arrived, or is the age of the parasitic blood drinker fallen? Will we continue to allow our souls to be held captive by the globalist system, or will we break free? The secret to reversing some effects of aging might be in the blood of the young.
Three new studies have found that blood from young mice can reverse symptoms of aging in older mice. Three studies will be published this week in the journal Science and Nature, each exploring the regenerative properties of young blood. The blood of the young can make the old young again. Are you kidding me? It sounds like out of a sci-fi movie or something. So what is it in the blood? Do we know? Peter Thiel here, a member of the PayPal Mafia, it's called. He's 48 years old, yet plans to live forever, 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 forever. The process is called parabiosis. And there's a company called Ambrosia that is openly raising money to bring it to market. Libertarian billionaire Peter Thiel, who was the star of the Republican National Convention for coming out as being gay, is also a fan of blood, blood transfusions. Parabiosis is a process of taking a young person's blood and putting it into your veins, into your cardiovascular system to rejuvenate your body with the essence of the young. What it really is is modern vampirism. Now, I want to be clear. I don't think Peter is a bad person just because he's attended Bilderberg meeting. I don't think he's a bad person just because he's into the science of blood transfusion. My concern, though, is with the larger cultural movement to see human beings and human fluids as nothing more than commodities. Mainstream media is selling the idea that this technique, parabiosis, is the fountain of youth and that Peter is the first person to really push it. Actually, if you read it in the press, the queen mother for more than 30 years before she died was getting sometimes entire whole body blood transfusions. It's been reported that Queen Elizabeth II also gets them as well as Prince Charles. But where the story really gets weird is that Prince Charles came out in the last decade and said, I'm a direct descendant of Vlad the Impaler, who was, of course, the Hungarian or Romanian uh, Count Dracula of history that opposed the Muslim invasion. The genealogy shows that I'm descended from Vlad the Impaler, you see. So I do have a bit of a stake in the country. As it were. I remember almost 20 years ago interviewing the author of Bloodlines, the Illuminati, Fritz Springmeier. And he was talking about the fact that Prince Charles and the royal family of England traced their lines back to Vlad the Impaler. I thought he was a kook. I thought he was a liar. Then a few years later, they were in the British news admitting that and saying that Prince Charles was obsessed with Dracula. Then they started digging up dead bodies on the royal family's palaces and that of children. And then Jimmy Savelle, who was highly connected to the royal family, uh, was basically caught with all these dungeons and torture centers, and it had turned out that he was a Satanist who was abusing children through the children's charity, and that the BBC had been running it and was basically protecting all of it. Then it made more and more sense. And then I began to research even more and found out that the people running things aren't physical, immortal vampires, but they have the spirit of what you describe as a vampire, and they believe their god Lucifer, if they establish a world government, is going to give them eternal life. And now they're mainlining the idea of baby parts and blood from the young to make the rich live longer. The Mayans and the Aztec culture that came out of it sold the body parts of those that were sacrificed to the gods. They themselves funded their priesthood on the sale of human meat. When we talk about the legend of vampires, we have to understand that every culture has this because there's always been psychopaths and other uh, groups of individuals who have joined forces and created central governments to actually carry out the practice of bloodletting, bloodlust, human sacrifice. And that the legend of blood drinking vampires has its roots in real activity that's taken place in every century, in every millennium, and in every culture. Now, to be clear, from our deep research, we don't believe that actual semi or totally immortal vampires exist. But the spirit of parasitic evil does exist and has been manifested through what we would call satanic bloodlines in every culture throughout history.
And we see, again, establishment media pushing the idea of women eating babies' placentas at birth and Kim Kardashian doing, doing blood facials. The idea that if we take something from some other human, we ourselves get something. This is the psychopaths setting up a system where they're the Morlocks from H.G. Wells and we are the suboid Eloys, the innocents who are being fed on. We have a predator class establishing a system where the general public is the prey. Now, the king of the vampires in all of world history is the communist Chinese. The communist Chinese kill between 65 and 84 million people, according to their own annals, just during Mao Zedong's communist rule. And to this day, hundreds of thousands of political dissidents a year who've committed no crimes are grabbed, put in prison, blood typed, prepared, and then rich Westerners fly into Japan just an hour away. Then the prisoner is taken. They are gutted in a mobile execution van on the tarmac. The fresh organs are loaded on ice, flown to Tokyo and other Japanese cities where the organs are implanted in rich Asians, Westerners, and others. This is true vampire activity where you murder a Buddhist or some other person for their religious or political activity and then steal their organs, make money off of it, and implant it in decadent slobs that paid for the luxury. The truth is, all of us have a little bit of vampire in us. All of us can be predators. All of us cannot have empathy for our fellow humans and dehumanize them. It's very easy to see the dumbed down public, if you're intelligent, and decide to not try to help them, but to just let them be ignorant and basically capitalize on the fact that they're unaware of what's happening around them. But all of us must transcend this because you reap what you sow. What comes around goes around. Call it karma. We as a species must face the light. We must look into the sun and not hide in the darkness. We must come together and realize that the elite know that there are very serious developments in life extension technology and have openly said they want a world government in control so the general public doesn't have access to this. There are a lot of clean, healthy, safe ways to extend our lives. And the establishment knows this. The fountain of youth won't be found in the blood of babies or virgins. We know that Satanists, on record, have been involved inside abortuaries conducting ceremonies. We know that children for thousands of years have been tortured so that they release hormones in their blood so that initiates can have these powerful religious experiences. That's why it's important to understand that humanity is not a commodity, that humanity is made in the image of God, and that we face absolute judgment when we attack the human genetic code and also the genetic code of this planet because it was made by the creator. The archetypes are clear. Legend points the way to not just the past, the present, but the future. The vampire operates in the dark, in the occult, in the secret, in the hidden. The liberty lover operates in the light. You will decide the future of humanity. You will decide if the sun is rising or if the sun is setting. We will decide whether the age of vampires is now dawning upon us or whether the age of vampires is now ending. As you've already understood, you are about to hear about a very exciting discovery, and maybe even a momentous one. A second Earth-like planet just a mere 4.243 light years away has been discovered, a distance that would take the average human using current propulsion technology hurtling through space at 20,000 miles per hour, give or take 100,000 years to travel to, has quite possibly been discovered right in our own backyard in the habitable zone of a neighboring system known as Proxima Centauri. Dubbed Kepler 452b, the Earth-like planet is roughly 60% larger Larger than Earth. Temperature that you would have on the surface of this planet if there's no atmosphere is actually minus 40 degrees, which is not spectacular, but 
Of course, we all want this planet to have an atmosphere, and if it has an atmosphere, it is actually pushing up the temperature through the greenhouse effect above zero degrees and in the liquid water habitable zone. Of course, the vampiric elite of planet Earth are beside themselves with world-conquering glee. Mark Zuckerberg and his Russian internet billionaire counterpart, Yuri Milner, are hatching a plan to escape the confines of the Earth-bound hell pit the elite created and preside over for greener pastures. But now we can transcend it with light beams, light sails, and the lightest spacecraft ever built. We can launch a mission to Alpha Centauri within a generation. Dr. Edith Weeks explains from the book titled Outer Space Development, International Relations and Space Law, although having been extremely successful, NASA is being constructed as incapable, as a failed government bureaucracy, indeed as somehow effeminate. In addition, there is a trend wherein private companies contracted with the government are gradually beginning to take over the business of space missions. These processes processes regarding space exploration space travel are consistent with my argument that part of the hyper privatization mandate is to transfer many of NASA's assets over to the private sector space missions to other celestial bodies large and small in the past were carried out exclusively by government entities over the next decade we will work with experts here at ESO and elsewhere to get as much information as possible about the Proxima Centauri planet perhaps as noted, even including whether it might bear life. Yuri Miller, Stephen Hawking, and Mark Zuckerberg oversee our project. It doesn't look like a space shuttle or, or Voyager. The ultimate spacecraft is going to be about the size of this, maybe uh, uh, quite a bit lighter and uh, uh, having much more functionality. Space travel was an ambitious endeavor that brought millions of people together. Humankind sat transfixed on Neil Armstrong's giant leap for mankind. Now, like everything else that has been hijacked by the emerging New World Order, the human prospect of traveling to distant worlds has been consolidated and relegated to a handful of hubris-riddled elite hell-bent on the survival of their own selfish goals. In your estimation, What's the probability of finding intelligent alien life in the next 20 years and why? The probability is low. Probably. May they one day travel at the speed of light only to finally arrive on a planet inhabited by 50-foot-tall patriots. John Bound for Infowars.com. Hillary Clinton interrupted her coughing fits, seizures, and three-day naps to attack the alt-right. Clinton savaged Trump for weaving dark conspiracy theories. Oh, you mean dark conspiracy theories like a YouTube video being responsible for Benghazi. What difference at this point does it make? She then proceeded to weave her own gigantic dark conspiracy theory, namely that Vladimir Putin controls InfoWars, Breitbart, and the entire alt-right. And the grand godfather of this global brand of extreme nationalism is Russian President Vladimir Putin. <laughs> That's funny because I don't recall receiving my paycheck in the mail from the Kremlin. It's also what happens when you listen to the radio host, Alex Jones. Right, so Trump is the conspiracy theorist for listening to Alex Jones, yet you just asserted that a former KGB officer under the communist government of the Soviet Union is now the leader of conservatives in America. What does that mean? Of course, Hillary failed to identify the real leader of the alt-right. <laughs> Oh yeah, and according to another one of Hillary's dark conspiracy theories, Trump is responsible for bullying in schools. The Trump effect. Bullying and harassment are on the rise in our schools. Right, because it's not like Trump supporters have been viciously attacked and harassed by leftists for the last six months solid. But wait, it gets even funnier. Hillary began reading out headlines written by Milo Yiannopoulos. <laughs> Hello. Birth control makes women unattractive and crazy. Nobody wants to f you. Would you rather your child had feminism or cancer? He is taking hate groups mainstream. 
and helping a radical fringe take over. Oh, you mean like you and Obama have been doing for the last two years by mainstreaming Black Lives Matter, a group that has inspired cop killers and whose ideological inspiration is on the FBI's most wanted terrorist list. These are racist ideas, race-baiting ideas, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant, anti-women, all key tenants making up the emerging racist ideology known as the alt Right. So posting dank memes makes you an evil racist, but openly praising and describing as your mentor a man who founded a KKK chapter called black people mongrels and campaigned against the Civil Rights Act. My friend and mentor Robert Seabird. That's just fine. Hillary also said that the alt-right is anti-women. This from the so-called feminist who takes hundreds of millions of dollars from a country that treats women little better than cattle. Nigel Farage, who stoked anti-immigrant sentiments to win the referendum, to have Britain leave the European Union, campaign with Donald Trump in Mississippi. Yeah, the key word there, Hillary, is win. He won because the tactic of constantly calling him a racist failed, just like your speech. <laughs> but seriously, if the alt-right are trolls, who inside Hillary's campaign thought it was a bright idea to do the one thing you're not supposed to do with trolls? Which is feed the trolls. The alt-right only succeeds if you respond. You just walked straight into a trap. It's a trap! The people running your campaign are complete idiots who don't understand how the internet works. This has backfired more than any of us could ever dream of. Hundreds of thousands of new people are now coming to our websites, where we'll continue to educate them about your failing health, rampant corruption, and sneering, arrogant elitism. Thanks, Hillary. Racist, 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 racist. Thematically, every day, looking at hundreds and hundreds of news stories, a theme will emerge. And more often than not, the number one theme is global censorship of news and information. Many people will look at the collapse of the dinosaur media and the collapse of its credibility as something positive, and I do overall, but really now, what do they have to lose? They have only intensified and then intensified again and then intensified again and again and again the unification of deception and twisting information. But we have parallel media that is exposing it in real time. The next logical move for them to engage in is the takeover and the shutdown of that media. We were warned last year, like right around this time of year by Matt Drudge, that he was told massive censorship was coming to the internet this year. And now we have even the Wall Street Journal today, an internet giveaway to the UN. The agreement with ICANN has been kept secret. And now they've gotten parts of it and it is the turnover to the UN. And that dovetails with the fact that we have new documents from the Daily Caller we need to do a unified story about this. Soros document, regulate internet to favor open society supporters. These are bloodthirsty monsters, and they're moving. Hillary puts out a fundraiser, press release two weeks ago, doesn't even hide it, and says, Breitbart doesn't have a right to exist. Neither does the alt-conservative media. We're going to shut it down when I get in. Then she gives a speech last week and names yours truly as enemy number one, basically. Originally, President Obama promised that the Fed's handover of the antitrust protected Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN, would not involve the United Nations. If we fall for, you know, a, a bunch of okie doke. Was this yet again a naive move by an incompetent president of the United States, or has this been the plan all along? Time and time again, Congress has failed to pass draconian laws to control the internet. The Communications Decency Act of 1996, the Intellectual Property Enforcement Act of 2007, the Cyber Security Act, the Protect IP Act of 2011, and SOPA, to name a few, all failed miserably against the ironclad in
integrity of the First Amendment. The globalists scurrying to their den of iniquity at Bilderberg would hear none of it. Their very fortunes and lives depend on it. The public knows too much already. Control of the Internet had to be torn from the protection of the U.S. Constitution. Larry Strickland of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, a Commerce Department agency which has overseen ICANN since 1998, said, We will not accept a proposal that replaces the NTIA role with a government-led or an intergovernmental solution. Now, after the full weight of Edward Snowden's revelations opened a treasure trove, the United States, in pure Hegelian dialectic fashion, offered to cede control to a multi-stakeholder, i.e. lobbyist-dominated model. That's right, the Internet will be in the hands of lobbyists, the very bottom feeders of the whims of globalism. How bad is it? In the intervening years, the United Nations and the European Union had jostled for control of the Internet. During a meeting in Dubai, the International Telecommunications Union, the telecom branch of the United Nations, demanded rules governing the Internet to be rewritten. Specifically, the International Organization proposed deep packet inspection authority that would allow it to monitor and censor content on the Internet. The United States walked out of that conference in protest. What appears to be the mundane task of assigning parking spaces for Internet businesses will more than likely face in the very near future a level of censorship that will make the free-thinking people of the World Wide Web's head spin. The Inquisition 2.0. The European Union has proposed the creation of a censorship and mass surveillance framework for EU countries funded by the European Commission. The Clean IT Project webpage explains the plan called for police to patrol Facebook and other social networks in search of extremist material and propaganda, in addition to allowing users to flag terrorist content and turn others into the police. In addition to censorship, the ICANN transfer will allow for a globalist taxation scheme. Former Bush administration State Department senior advisor Christian Witten told the Daily Caller, if the UN gains control of what amounts to the directory and traffic signals of the Internet, it can impose whatever taxes it likes. It likely would start with a tax on registering domains and expand from there. Transition that stewardship to the global community. Fadi Chahadi has been the CEO at ICANN since 2012. After having negotiated the full-scale globalization of the Internet, Chahadi will be aptly rewarded by the New World Order, acting as a senior advisor at Abri Partners, a private equity firm that controls an already monopolized media. Also as a co-chair of the newly formed World Internet Conference in Wuzhen, China. And last but not least, a senior advisor to Klaus Schwab, founder and chairman of the the World Economic Forum. Schwab attended Bilderberg in 2016. An internal proposed strategy from George Soros's Open Society Justice Initiative calls for international regulation of private actors' decisions on, quote, what information is taken off the Internet and what may remain, end quote. Those regulations, the document notes, should favor, quote, those most supportive of open society, end quote. Open society being George Soros. Soros's organization. Soros and company, rather than striking directly at free speech progenitors like Infowars.com, are one month away from recklessly pulling the rug out from under everything. Now that ICANN has relinquished control of the medium, globalist institutions can move forward with plans to scrub the Internet of all content unacceptable to the global elite and their minions at the United Nations. John Bound for Infowars.com. I cannot help asking those who have caused this situation, do you realize now what you've done? We even know year by year what's going to happen, and they know we know. It's only you that they tell these fables and you buy it and spread it to the citizens of your countries. And your people do not feel a sense of the impending danger. This is what worries me. How do you not understand that the world is being pulled in an irreversible direction? That is the problem. But they pretend like nothing's going on. I don't even know how to get through to you people anymore. 
Putin will try to destabilize uh, Ukraine, but the Ukrainians, uh, the large majority of Ukrainians, are determined to be independent of, of Russia. Well, then why are you interfering in our business? Don't meddle in our business. Sort out your own issues first. Mr. Trump declared that he is ready to restore full cooperative relations with Russia. What's so bad about that? We all welcome that. Do you not? In recent years, we have seen a cacophony of geopolitical experts, historians, statisticians, statesmen come out and warn that the world is hurtling towards major military conflict between the United States and Russia. And that the climate that we see in the world today is very similar to what we saw before World War I and World War II. Vladimir Putin has come out multiple times in the last six months at press conferences and warned the world that the West, under the guise of missile defense systems, is moving offensive nuclear weapons up to the border with Russia. I study the facts. I know that two years ago, George Soros bragged on CNN that he had the major part with the State Department in overthrowing the elected government of Ukraine. First on Ukraine, one of the things that many people recognized about you was that you, during the revolutions of 1989, funded a lot of dissident activity, civil society groups in Eastern Europe, in Poland, the Czech Republic. Are you doing similar things in Ukraine? Well, I set up a foundation in Ukraine before Ukraine became independent of uh, Russia. Um, and the foundation has been uh, functioning ever since. And it played a, an important part in events now. Now, in the eastern area of Ukraine that has always been part of Russia, the Crimea, it means the border in Russian, we have proxy armies of NATO battling Russian troops, and the Russian losses have been high. Just last week, Vladimir Putin came out in a press conference and pointed out that Kiev is launching basically asymmetrical attacks, or what he called terrorism. And whether you support Russia or Putin or don't, or whether you're just neutral, it should be a major news item here in the United States. Here's a segment of that news conference. It is true that our special forces have foiled an attempt by a group of sabotage infiltrators belonging to the Ukrainian Defense Ministry's intelligence agency who were seeking to penetrate the Crimean territory. And in view of these events, it has become pointless to meet with the Ukraine's current authorities at the Normandy format. We have suffered losses as a result of this operation. We undoubtedly cannot turn a blind eye to the deaths of our servicemen. But I would also like to address our American and European partners. I think today it has become obvious for everyone that Kiev's current authorities are not seeking ways to solve problems through negotiations, but have turned to terrorism instead. This is a highly troubling development. There are no other reasons for conducting such actions other than to distract the Ukrainian people and divert their attention from the disastrous economic situation and the miserable conditions most of them are living in. And here we are, two years after George Soros and the State Department brag that they overthrew the elected government of Ukraine. And now as NATO and Western forces mass on the Russian border, and as Russia puts 40,000 troops on its border and goes on high alert, and as Putin says, no more detente, no more talk with Ukraine. You are attacking Russian citizens in your east. Zero coverage here in our media, unless there's stories saying that I'm a Russian agent or that Infowars or Donald Trump have sold out to Putin. No, we've sold out to common sense and decency and not having a nuclear war. And I see the emails that come in and the comments on Infowars by a vocal minority saying that I'm a fearmonger because I'm concerned about global conflict. 
Yes, I'm concerned about the West funding Al Qaeda and ISIS to take over the Middle East and North Africa. I'm upset about our governments creating thousands of trillions of dollars of fake derivatives to buy up the world. I'm concerned about the Clinton Foundation taking money from third world dictators and Middle Eastern governments that oppress women and homosexuals. I'm concerned about the laissez-faire attitude of our elites. But I'm even more concerned about the general population. Because I've had people that I know personally say to me, Alex, we've been hearing about nuclear war since the 1960s. It's fear-mongering. It's never going to happen. And the New York Times makes jokes about fear porn. We have the power to destroy life on this planet many times over. We have Promethean fire that will either take us to the stars or turn this whole planet into a giant tombstone. I have three children. I study geopolitics. I'm involved in trying to build a better world. I want peace with Russia and China. I don't want war. And I see our very elites that tell us don't worry about war being the ones that gave nuclear reactors to North Korea so they could create atomic bombs and who gave the missile secrets for ICBMs to China in the 1990s. The very people telling us don't worry about all this are the very ones that are pushing our world towards the brink of extinction and not just for humanity. We've seen The Hague recently rule against the Chinese in the South China Sea. And we've seen China go into a very belligerent tone, threatening war with the world. Whether you support the communist Chinese or don't, I'm sitting here as an American patriot pointing out that we have aircraft carriers and fleets openly lined up against Chinese ships in the South China Sea in the last two months with the People's Daily and the president of China saying war with the United States is imminent. And there's a thousand times more news, literally, about some American athlete in South America at the Olympics who might have lied about being robbed. That's the big story and not this. World Net Daily is reporting that six plus trillion dollars is missing from the Pentagon. The last time CBS News reported the day before 9-11 that $2 trillion was missing, you saw what happened. And that's just the beginning of what I'm talking about. The elite is all basically running to armored fortresses and redoubts in New Zealand. They're going underground. It's admitted. They're building huge walls from Hillary's palace to Zuckerberg's around their houses. They're acting like it's the end of the world while telling us, don't worry about it. It's a conspiracy theory if you even talk about Putin discussing nuclear war. These are crazy times to be alive. And I'm simply here ringing the alarm bell saying, we've gotten by without a nuclear war so far and we're very close to one right now. Let's have a debate about this instead of whether or not somebody on the Olympic team lied about being assaulted. Let's force real issues out there in the open. I'm Alex Jones asking all of you to think about the facts, to weigh the evidence, and to decide, is having 50,000 nuclear weapons on this planet safe? Is massing troops on the Russian border a good idea? Is funding ISIS and Al-Qaeda a good idea? The decision is up to all of us, and we should have a serious debate about it. The globalists don't want that debate to happen, but we're here to force that debate front and center, just like we've done about election fraud, just like we've done about GMO, just like we've done about our government funding ISIS on every front. InfoWars is the tip of the spear because we have 28 million viewers and listeners just like you that are awake and who are involved. So my friends, it's time to take action and to stop a new world war. But it really hit me in the last few hours that it really is you, the listeners, that hit the zeitgeist. InfoWars was only one focal point of a media organization who saw what was coming, understood what happened, and did want to go along with it. So we built it and you came. I mean, it's so important. And I don't mean this in a patronizing way, but in a very, very serious way. Understand, you're the eyes and ears of the real media. The globalists destroyed our old media, so we're not the alternative media. We are the real media. And we are the teleprompter free, open, free flow of information media that the globalists just can't counter.
and that's why they want to shut us down and shut down Drudge Report and Breitbart and others, is because they want to shut you down. You already think and believe and understand these basic facts. You're the ones reporting it to us most of the time. You're the leakers. You're the sources. You're the information. But they don't want you to have a sounding board to be able to bounce information off of to realize that what you say and what you do and what you stand for actually has value. Globalism is dehumanization. Globalism is a system that's meant to bring in dehumanization. And it wants you to feel alone. No family, no tribe, no kinship, no independent organization that's based on true human values. They want you all alone like an inner city child who doesn't have a mother or father, who gets taken over by a gang and who'll do horrible things because they believe that gang is their family. And that's what the New World Order is. It's what political correctness is. It's all trying to arrest development, control people, make them be totally alone, and then sell them horrible globalist agendas as something that's supposedly going to fulfill them. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what the New World Order is. It's what it stands for, and it's what it's always going to be about. It is about enslavement. It is about not believing in you. It is about dumbing the message down and thinking you're stupid. You say what you want about Donald Trump. He is taking the globalist on. He is taking the New World Order on. He is talking to you like you're smart. He is going down to Mexico and saying, we're all being screwed over by globalism. Let's come together. He is pushing detente with Russia. That's why the media says he's trying to start World War III. While Hillary threatens war with Russia, Donald Trump is the Newtonian physics response to the great tyranny and the interdimensional gravity of corruption and oppression. He is the manifestation of the people's will and the collective unconscious wanting to resist. And Trump is only the first of many people that are going to manifest through the powerful human system to resist the New World Order. Infowars is only one part of that as well. And if we realize these metaphysical rules, if we realize <clears throat> what's happening, what's unfolding, what's taking place, there's no way the globalists could ever put this genie back in the bottle. So make no mistake, I talk about a lot of really big things happening, a lot of amazing things happening. And that's because big things and incredible things are happening. History is happening now. We're in a world of wonder. Everything the social engineers engage in is about making you not see the magic and the wonder of the universe and feeling empty and then only looking to the television and PR and Madison Avenue and the different disinformation agents for fulfillment. They want you bought into their Hollywood system believing that you're inadequate because you're not some narcissistic woman or, or, or some guy that looks like he's Superman. Again, they pick the image of a woman that maybe one out of 500 women look like so you feel inadequate and bad and never feel like you're fulfilled and beautiful. Because you have lovely curves or voluptuous. That's just one microcosm of how they operate. And I'm here to tell you that there is no utopia we're offering, but hell is where the globalists are leading us. We'll be back. It's a big second hour, ladies and gentlemen, with the Trump speech, Hillary's trail of death, billion dollar baby, ISIS Supreme Commanders, Hillary Clinton, and more. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday worldwide broadcast. I want to first go to the incredible speech Donald Trump gave last week in Mexico about unity, but also sovereignty and standing up against multinational globalists that are coming in and taking over our nation states and really setting up systems of financial oppression. This is a really powerful speech. Uh, the U.S. media captured by the globalists really tried to demonize it. Try to take it out of context. So here is the speech unedited of Donald Trump in Mexico. Let us now hear the words of the Republican candidate to the presidency of the United States of America, Mr. Donald Trump. Thank you. It is a great honor to be invited by you, Mr. President. A great, great honor. Thank you. We had a very substantive, direct, and constructive exchange of ideas over quite a period of time. I was straightforward in presenting my views 
about the impacts of current trade and immigration policies on the United States. As you know, I love the United States very much, and we want to make sure that the people of the United States are very well protected. You equally expressed your feelings and your love for Mexico. The United States and Mexico share a 2,000-mile border, a half a trillion dollars in annual trade, and one million legal border crossings each and every day. We are united by our support for democracy, a great love for our people, and the contributions of millions of Mexican Americans to the United States. And I happen to have a tremendous feeling for Mexican Americans, not only in terms of friendships, but in terms of the tremendous numbers that I employ in the United States. And they are amazing people, amazing people. I have many friends, so many friends, and so many friends coming to Mexico and in Mexico. I'm proud to say how many people I employ. And the United States, first, second, and third generation Mexicans are just beyond reproach. Spectacular, spectacular, hardworking people. I have such great respect for them and their strong values of family, faith, and community. We all share a common interest in keeping our hemisphere safe, prosperous, and free. No one wins in either country when human smugglers and drug traffickers prey on innocent people, when cartels commit acts of violence, when illegal weapons and cash flow from the United States into Mexico, or when migrants from Central America make the dangerous trek, and it is very, very dangerous, into Mexico or the United States without legal authorization. I shared my strong view that NAFTA has been a far greater benefit to Mexico than it has been to the United States, and that it must be improved upon to make sure that workers, and so important, in both countries benefit from fair and reciprocal trade. I expressed that to the United States and in that of the United States that we must take action to stem this tremendous outflow of jobs from our country. It's happening every day. It's getting worse and worse and worse, and we have to stop it. Prosperity and happiness in both of our countries will increase if we work together on the following five shared goals. Number one, ending illegal immigration. Not just between our two countries, but including the illegal immigration and migration from Central and South Americans and from other regions that impact security and finances in both Mexico and the United States. This is a humanitarian disaster. The dangerous treks, the abuse by gangs and cartels, and the extreme physical dangers. And it must be solved. It must be solved quickly. Not fair to the people anywhere worldwide, you can truly say, but certainly not fair to the people of Mexico or the people of the United States. Number two, having a secure border is a sovereign right and mutually beneficial. We recognize and respect the right of either country to build a physical barrier or wall on any of its borders to stop the illegal movement of people, drugs, and weapons. Cooperation toward achieving this shared objective, and it will be shared, of safety for all citizens is paramount to both the United States and to Mexico. Number three, dismantling drug cartels and ending the movement of illegal drugs, weapons, and funds across our border. This can only be done 
with cooperation, intelligence and intelligence sharing, and joint operations between our two countries. It's the only way it's going to happen. Improving NAFTA, number four. NAFTA is a 22-year-old agreement that must be updated to reflect the realities of today. There are many improvements that could be made that would make both Mexico and the United States stronger and keep industry in our hemisphere. We have tremendous competition from China and from all over the world. Keep it in our hemisphere. Workers in both of our countries need a pay raise very desperately. In the United States, it's been 18 years, 18 years, wages are going down. Improving pay standards and working conditions will create better results for all and all workers in particular. There's a lot of value that can be created for both countries by working beautifully together. And that, I am sure, will happen. Number five, keep manufacturing wealth in our hemisphere. When jobs leave Mexico, the U.S. or Central America, and go overseas, it increases poverty and pressure on social services, as well as pressures on cross-border migration. Tremendous pressure. The bond between our two countries is deep and sincere, and both our nations benefit from a close and honest relationship between our two governments. A strong, prosperous, and vibrant Mexico is in the best interests of the United States and will keep and help keep for a long, long period of time America together. Both of our countries will work together for mutual good and most importantly for the mutual good of our people. Mr. President, I want to thank you. This has been a tremendous honor and I call you a friend. Thank you. The presidential election process is beginning to reek of corruption. Homeland Security Chief Jay Johnson recently determined that our election process should be overseen by the Department of Homeland Security because it has been dubbed critical infrastructure, akin to the financial sector and the power grid. Truth be told, Mr. Johnson, this election is critical to the total emergence of a totalitarian new world order that has almost crossed the finish line. Meanwhile, a desperate psyop to spin Hillary into the Oval Office Office is fully underway as Matt Lauer will host a propagandized non-debate whereas the Daily Caller reports it will be a one-hour forum where Clinton and Trump will answer questions about national security military affairs and veterans issues in front of an audience mainly made up of members of the military the two candidates will not be on the stage at the same time but will instead go back to back this after Trump dominated the last 48 hour news cycle with true presidential aplomb we are united by our support for democracy a great love for our people and the contributions of millions of Mexican Americans to the United States we agreed on the importance of ending the illegal flow of drugs cash guns and people across our border and to put the cartels out of business. We are going to uphold the laws of the nation and defend our sovereignty and security, and we are going to defend our border. And now with Hillary sinking in the polls, as Rasmussen reports, Hillary Clinton's post-convention lead has disappeared, putting her behind Donald Trump for the first time nationally since mid-July. The latest weekly Rasmussen reports White House Watch National Telephone and Online Survey shows Trump with 40% support to Clinton's 39% among likely U.S. voters after Clinton led 42% to 38% a week ago. As a result, the globalist empire is fiercely striking back. It certainly takes more than trying to make up for a year of insults and insinuations 
by dropping in on our neighbors for a few hours and then flying home again. That is not how it works. It's like, it's like anthrax dormant in our soil. We are a nation of immigrants who turn on immigrants as scapegoats when normal politics doesn't work anymore. And so when the wind's just right and the host is weak, just wait. The blame the immigrants nativism that is always around at some level, it comes back. It comes out of the secret societies. It comes roaring out once again out of the dark. I think it was kind of a diplomatic embarrassment. We'll get to his speech later, but he's been talking for a year about we're going to build a wall and Mexico's going to pay for it. And then he goes and he sits down and he goes eyeball to eyeball with the president of Mexico. And what, he forgets suddenly to bring it up or he's too afraid to bring it up? And riding on the coattails of the PSYOP, trolls upon trolls echoing half-baked disinformation in an effort to chip away Trump's emerging bold domination of the real issues. The Daily Caller reports, Liberals did not like Donald Trump's immigration speech in Arizona. Some even attacked the angel moms, parents whose children have been killed by illegal immigrants. Mark McKinnon wrote, Trump surrounded on Phoenix stage by angel moms who say their kids were murdered by illegal immigrants. This is pretty much a hate rally. Joy Reid wrote, the way they call people illegals, so dehumanizing. The mainstream media, in true Goebbels zeal, even blurred out Trump's name in an interview with a man who recently rescued a baby from a hot car. Again, propaganda was legalized in America in 2013 with the death of the Smith-Munt Act, with the only rational explanation one could surmise to be used on the American people. Propaganda is running wild, ladies and gentlemen, and a cabal of impetuous globalists are pushing their narrative into overdrive. John Bound for Infowars.com. Much ado about Hillary. Heat Street reported Hillary has been using pillows at every appearance to prop herself up. But it's truly the media spin cycle of her scandalous path of deviation in the face of the justice system that has propped up Hillary's presidential aspirations. How so, you ask? Because if Hillary's true criminal modus operandi was examined by a legitimate investigative media, the dead bodies stuck in Hillary's web would be front and center. And that that trail of the dead is a long one. Vince Foster, Mary Mahoney, Judy Gibbs, Walter Scheib, Charles Ruff, Jim McDougal, Admiral Borda, Barry Seal, Michael Hastings, Sandy Hume, Gareth Williams are just a few of the ghosts in the Clintons' past. But now, fresh blood is being spilled with auspicious intentions regarding the Clinton campaign. June 22, 2016, UN official John Ash was murdered in a bizarre weightlifting incident while facing a trial for taking bribes from Clinton tied Chinese billionaire David Ng. July 10th, 2016, Seth Rich, DNC voter expansion data director, was murdered in Washington, D.C. after possibly being tied to the massive email leak that upended the DNC. July 25th, 2016, former DNC chairman Joe Montano died of a supposed heart attack. August 1st, 2016, author Victor Thorne shot near his home after writing a slew of books exposing the Clinton crime family. August 2nd, 2016, Sean Lucas died mysteriously after serving a fraud class action suit against the Democratic Party. Poll numbers from Zogby Analytics now show that Hillary and Trump are neck and neck. Meanwhile, America's most trusted physician, Dr. Drew, raises legitimate concerns over Hillary's health. And based on the information that she has provided and her doctors have provided, we were gravely concerned not just about her health care, not about her health, but her health care. Why? Well, it's, it's hard for people to understand. I mean, both, both of us concluded that if we were providing the care that she was receiving, we'd be ashamed to show up in a doctor's lounge. We'd be laughed out. It's, it's, she's receiving sort of 1950-level sort of care by our evaluation. And Republicans of the House motioned to file perjury charges against Hillary after FBI Director James Comey contradicted Hillary's claims of innocence regarding the handling of classified material. There was nothing marked classified on my emails, either sent or received. Nothing was marked classified at the time I sent or received it. I think it's also important to say something about the marking of classified information. Only a 
very small number of the emails here containing classified information bore markings that indicated the presence of classified information. But even if information is not marked classified in an email, participants who know or should know that the subject matter is classified are still obligated to protect it. What he was very careful, the director Comey said that she didn't lie to them. But, you know, the public comments are one, one area, but when you lie under oath, that's a whole nother level. And I was trying to get there because I wanted to know if that went towards her intent. However, these are the kind of pressures Hillary Clinton can endure because after decades of lying to Congress, it all begins to run together. In the very near future, once the smoke clears, Hillary Clinton's race to the halls of the hijacked corporocratic throne of the United States will go down in history as the most bizarre political act of the 21st century. Who else will ever be able to match the amount of minor corruption? That it's called augmented reality. I thought humans interfacing with this incredible third dimension, having sight, having smell, having taste, having touch, having emotions and feelings inside our hearts. I thought that was augmented reality. I thought that was consciousness. But now we're told it's the number one search, five, six days running, Pokemon Go. In fact, some of the amazing crew members at our own office are playing it. And I'm not judging them for checking out something new and interesting. My kids have played Pokemon, you know, the card game, years ago. You have these little monsters that you play against each other. You've got to go find the monsters, capture them, train them, all the rest of it. Whatever, board games have been around, chess games have been around three, 4,000 years. That's great. The problem is, is that we see more and more people living in second life, buying Ferraris with real money that don't really exist, forming fake relationships in cyberspace, and becoming very unsuccessful in the real world. And we see the social engineers pushing as hard as they can to get people to tune out of the real world, this incredible planet hurtling through space and our amazing moon and all the other things that are happening on our planet and dial into artificial systems created by Nintendo or by Microsoft or by Google or by Apple. They are creating the universes in which we interface instead of humans living in the real universe and being creative, sentient beings yourself. They are building false realities into which they want to induct you so they can play God. So I'm not saying anybody's bad who wants to play video games or who wants to be involved in World of Warcraft or any of that. All I'm saying is the metrics are there. Our IQs are dropping. The screen time is lowering our IQs. Our synapses are collapsing. Humanity is in crisis. And Pokemon Go is illustrating my own fact. Ambulance drivers, EMTs across not just the US but the world are saying that suddenly, because there's augmented reality, kids that have never been outside their house, that spend less time on average than prisoners do outside, are suddenly out in the real world looking for these mythical monsters so they can show off for their friends and collect more. So in a way, the Matrix is actually backfiring on itself as it attempts to go out and take over reality. That's what Microsoft and others have said they want for decades, is to have every real area of the world with this whole data list and this whole information cube around it to track what you do. But in a way, it's actually backfiring as people go out into the real world themselves looking for the false reality. But I can't get over the image of brain-dead zombies that we see on TV, walking, looking at their phones, going into traffic. I can't help but think about the images of people that walk into fountains at malls or that drive off cliffs while they're watching their GPFs or drive into raging rivers because they're making this their entire consciousness. I mean, I'm out here supposedly at a nearby golf course looking for one of these Pokemons. And I'm told that it's magically laid some eggs about 100 yards over there, and that I can go over there and watch it hatch and capture it for myself. But in truth, it's not really there. It's being geolocated. I'm being tracked, everything I'm doing, by the way, by this app. It admits it's been hacking millions of people's phones. 
and I'm now feeding this data to the matrix of where I am and what I'm doing to find some mythical projection that it's shooting onto my phone. Again, this is giving all of my personal privacy, all of my personal power over to Nintendo to sell my habits, to sell my behaviors, to sell my data to whoever they want. The studies don't lie. This dehumanizes you. This ends up destroying your humanity in the final equation. If you use it in limited amounts, sure, it's interesting. You can meet like-minded people that are into it. I'm not judging anybody, Lord knows. I'm just simply pointing out we should ask ourselves why Pokemon has been more popular the last five, six days than porn. When I heard that the British exit from the Euro was more popular than porn, the only thing in years to beat that, I was proud of the people. Anti-globalism is number one, even above simulated procreation. But the truth is, porn is just like this. It's simulated. It isn't real. You're living through somebody else's template, somebody else's intercourse, somebody else's activities that are then edited and presented and sold to you. So while they live, you sleep. And that's all I'm saying. Every study, every piece of research shows it, that forest bathing and getting outdoors and being in the open air and looking up at the sky raises your awareness, raises your IQ, getting in the wind, feeling the reality, seeing the birds fly around in the air. But I tell you, it is sacrilege to the gamers and sacrilege to the TV heads who you get around and they don't talk about what's happening in the world. They don't talk about what they're doing with men or women. They don't talk about what they're doing with art. They don't talk about hiking or camping trips they're going on. They don't care about their work. They don't care about the world. They, they're cynical and don't care about the new world order on average. All they want to do is live in their fantasy land. And I, for one, am sick and tired of that, and I'm reaching into those people that are living in false worlds built by other people, built by these gaming companies that make billions of dollars off of you, that this is the ultimate form of slavery. And let me be clear, a lot of the big game companies are patriots. A lot of the big game companies are listeners of mine. My God, I've been like eight or nine big video games over the years. I've signed contracts and let them use my voice or image. And there's a lot of good messages in video games, just like movies, just like TV. But there's some bad messages. And the globalists are basically pushing this because they don't want you to be involved in the real world. Look, it is kind of fun. I'm going to admit it. To just not look at the sunset over there and not look at the sky or the moon and just start looking at this. It's so much fun. It's so neat. Wait a minute. There's eggs over there. There's, there's something, there's something, there's something hatching. Actually, this is pretty cool, guys. I, I'm into this. Uh, over there, it's, it's oh, oh my God. Oh my God, I just found a new, can't you see it over there? It's, it's, it's right there, and now I can see it for myself. Ladies and gentlemen, right there, Trigglypuff is the newest Pokemon. It's given birth. Trigglypuff is giving birth. Trigglypuff is giving birth to a baby to a baby Darth Vader. <laughs> it's my own fantasy land. I don't have to actually affect change in the real world. I can just believe whatever I want and be a star here. Oh my God. Oh. Peter Hastings oh, off the set star. Peter Hastings off the set star. I've actually changed my mind now that I'm in the matrix. Don't look outside the television or the internet or the computer. Only look into this world that's real. This world. This world where you could actually create something isn't real. The only world that's real is the world where Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and your trusted local professors tell you what words you're allowed to use. So go back to your dorms and play Pokemon Go. And whatever you do, don't hack into Pokemon and actually create your own characters. Whatever you do, don't use their own memes and their own systems to wake people up. Just conform and pretend you were never conscious and you were never alive. And whatever you do, never visit, while the internet is still somewhat free, Infowars.com. I really um, just want everybody to take a deep breath and relax and just... You know, sit back because here they come again.
open up. And we have to pause because it's only allows to go for about 11 or 12 seconds. So just another pause. It's also what happens when you listen to the radio host, Alex Jones. Yep, Alex Jones, the guy that puts the music that makes me have to edit, re-edit, edit again, edit again. Claims that 9-11 and the Oklahoma City bombings were inside jobs. He even said the victims of the Sandy Hook massacre were child actors. Just have to do one more. <laughs> Live from Austin, yeah, Texas. Hillary looks normal, doesn't she? It's Alex Jones. This really. They've created ISIS. Hillary Clinton created ISIS with Obama. He is becoming ISIS's best recruiter. They are going to people showing videos of Donald Trump insulting Islam and Muslims in order to recruit more radical jihadists. Hillary Clinton would have us all forget about the failed regime changes she oversaw in Egypt and Libya that led up to the staged rollout of Benghazi. As an actual Marine sergeant pointed out to Bill Clinton on the campaign trail back in February. I did eight years active duty service, two tours to Iraq. I had uh, between the 31, I had seven that were killed, six wounded beyond their turn. And I have met with many of these Gold Star parents and families, so I've seen them. Uh, what do you think should be done with the VA? I've seen them mourn. And the thing is that we had four lives in Benghazi that were killed, and your wife tried to cover it up. Uh, it Benghazi. Now commonly known as a bungled covert operation, nothing less than a CIA arms transfer of Gaddafi's pilfered arsenal to ISIS, Hillary's accusations of Trump now being somehow responsible for ISIS are on their face laughable. The way Donald Trump talks about terrorism and his, you know, very um, insulting language toward Muslims is making him the recruiting sergeant for ISIS. In January of this year, Soros dropped $8 million to boost Hillary's sluggish campaign. While we are all overwhelmed and diverted by the ISIS chaos, the New World Order bankers extend their tentacles into their customers' bank accounts worldwide. As Zero Hedge reports, WikiLeaks has now verified what former head of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, admitted one month ago when he said that Europe's economic Economic depression is the result of deliberate policy choices made by EU elites. It is also what AIG bank strategist Bernard Connolly said back in 2008 when laying out what Europe wants. The evidence is staggering. As WikiLeaks published the transcript of a teleconference that took place on March 19, 2016, between the top two IMF officials in charge of managing the Greek debt crisis, Paul Thompson, the head of IMF's European department, and Delia Velkulescu, the IMF mission chief for Greece. The IMF officials say that a threat of an imminent financial catastrophe, as The Guardian puts it, is needed to force other players into accepting its measures, such as cutting Greek pensions and working conditions, or as Bloomberg puts it, considering a plan to cause a credit event in Greece and destabilize Europe. Under the banner of the globalist soft war through the terror of ISIS, Europe is gradually being forced into total submission. While while many Americans bitterly cling to their blind ignorance in the face of an upcoming storm. Oh, I see nothing. I was not here. I did not even get up this morning. With all due respect, the fact is we had four dead Americans. Was it because of a protest or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? It is our job to figure out what happened and do everything we can to prevent it from ever happening again, Senator. As ISIS Brigadier General Hillary Clinton lectures the home of the brave and the land of the free, the average American citizen is genuinely insulted. John Bound for InfoWars.com.
They said in October I'd be dead in six months. It's also what happens when you listen to the radio host, Alex Jones. I don't know what happens in somebody's mind or how dark their heart must be <laughs> to say things like that. We came, we saw, he died. <laughs> the intervention led by NATO to topple Gaddafi has led to a failed state. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Libya was not perfect under Gaddafi, but it had, even if to some extent, a functioning government, one unified country, it was a sovereign state. <laughs> Libya now has two rival governments, a civil war that has left over 4,000 people dead, and its cities are in ruin. I don't know what happens in somebody's mind or how dark their heart must be. Women are treated, discriminated against in all of these countries she took money against. Gays and lesbians are either executed or punished severely. They're mistreated. Uh, she claims to be their champion. We let ISIS take this position. It was Hillary Clinton that she should get an award from them as the founder of ISIS. We had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. And we were successful. And this really just is so disgusting. When Vince Foster left his White House office on that July day in 1993, he told his secretary that he would be back. But the deputy White House counsel and boyhood friend of Bill Clinton never returned. There has been this urgency to end this. And, you know, historically that makes no sense. We all remember Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in June in California. Google is being accused of hiding negative stories about Hillary and her campaign by changing its algorithm to marry stories like the Clinton body count story. That's according to website InfoWars. If a Google user types in Clinton body, they get car repair shop results instead of a story that talks about a list of people tied to the Clintons who have died under mysterious circumstances over the last three decades. Uh, whistleblowers go to significant efforts to get us material and often very significant risks. We have upcoming leaks in relation to Hillary Clinton. You know, the emails we published show that Hillary Clinton is receiving constant updates about my personal situation. As a 27-year-old who uh, works for the DNC, who was shot in the back, murdered uh, just two weeks ago uh, for un unknown reasons as he was walking down the street in Washington. I don't know what happens in somebody's mind or how dark their heart must be.